Good morning. It's really exciting to be here in this very fancy venue. Um, and it's particularly exciting for me to have such a large audience. Because um, I do quite a few talks to local societies and museums. And more often than not, I do end up with a slightly more select group than I might have otherwise anticipated. A couple of years ago, I was invited to do a talk via Skype to Chicago. This was um, an organization for senior citizens to get together, um, have a bit of a social group, and listen to a different talk every time. So that sounded pretty fun. I'd be beamed by the wonders of technology over thousands of miles to Chicago. Well, the day before my talk, the organizer emailed me very apologetically, saying that, unfortunately, only about eight people had signed up to hear me. And he'd asked all his other regulars, um, why weren't they going to come along? And they'd said, because they like quack medicine, and they didn't want to hear anything bad about it. <laughs> so that was interesting to me, that even though I talk about remedies from more than 100 years ago, I wasn't really even going to say anything about modern alternative medicine. And yet, they still found it somewhat threatening to their worldview. Um, so that I found interesting. I realize that that is a really difficult thing for all of you to overcome when engaging in skeptical activism. Well, I've been studying and writing about quack remedies for about 10 years or so now. And it's really important to me to always look at the context in which these remedies are being used. I want to try and understand people's motivations for engaging in quack medicine. There's kind of a stereotype of historical quacks about them being a kind of comedy bad guy who are preying on gullible and stupid people. And I don't think that's really fair, especially to patients who often had good social and personal reasons for choosing the remedies that they did within the context of their time. Well, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on some general patent remedies of the 19th and early 20th centuries. This is just a friend's collection that shows some of the wide variety of things that were available. The term patent medicine, as you might well know, originally referred to when remedies did have a patent from the king. And as time went on, nobody really bothered doing that anymore, but the name stuck. And it referred to any kind of over-the-counter remedy that you could buy perhaps from a grocer or a chemist or a street seller or even send off for by mail order. The ingredients tended to be kept secret, and also, very often, the proprietors didn't have any medical qualifications. So, of course, that brought them under fire from people who did have qualifications. I'm not planning today to draw any really specific parallels between the medicines of the past and the alternative remedies of today, but I know that many of you will recognize a lot of the promotional activities that I'm talking about, and you'll probably be able to think of quite a few modern equivalents for the remedies that I mention. So, for example, one way of getting people to buy your remedy is to aim it at people who don't really have anything much wrong with them. What we might now, I suppose, call the worried well. This is Clark's blood mixture, which was invented in the 1860s by a chemist in Lincoln called Francis Jonathan Clark. And he was only 19 when he brought this on the market. Unlike a lot of remedies of the Victorian era, it wasn't promoted as a cure-all or a panacea. It was only aimed at conditions that were caused by bad blood. Fortunately for Clark, pretty much anything could be related to bad blood, as you can see from some of the many disorders that are shown on the advert here. And there are quite a few other brands of blood mixture popping up as well. A blood tonic was a really good bet for somebody who wanted to make money out of patent medicines, because you could promote it not just as a cure for the kinds of diseases mentioned here, but also just as a means of generally keeping healthy. The advertisers of Clark's told customers, keep the blood pure and the health of the system will follow. So the idea was to encourage people to keep taking it, even if they didn't feel anything more than a little off-color. 
you'd probably want to keep a couple of bottles in the house all the time, and you'd have to keep buying more in order to maintain your wellness, rather like a lot of the less reputable supplements on the market today. Well, while tonics like Clark's blood mixture aimed to get some vigorous, healthy blood coursing through your veins, there are other products that aim to do the exact opposite. This one is um, arsenic complexion wafers. <laughs> and towards the end of the Victorian era, products like this became available to encourage people, especially women, to obtain a fashionably pale and interesting complexion. In 1895, there was a popular periodical called Myra's Journal of Dress and Fashion, and they advised their readers, it is not only natural, but love-worthy in every nice woman to endeavor to look at least five years younger than she really is. Now, one way of doing that would be to start lying about your age before you're 25, and then you'd be able to maintain the pretense a bit longer. But, of course, another way of doing it was to take something like this. Wafers was a format of pill, so this was something that you would actually take internally. <laughs> Arsenic had already, in a generic sense, enjoyed a long reputation for creating a pale, unlined complexion, uh, which it did by um, destroying the red blood cells. Um, but in the 1890s, there was a boom in actual branded products like this. This one is Dr. McKenzie's, which was introduced in 1893, and the advert mentions that they also sold an arsenical toilet soap for you to wash your face with. Within a couple of years, that soap was reaching sales of 340,000 bars a year, and yet there were no actual reports of anybody dropping dead or having symptoms from using it. It did turn out that there was a reason for that. During 1896 and 1897, several chemists received court summons under the Sale of Food and Drugs Act for selling arsenical soap. And their offense wasn't about it containing arsenic, it was that it didn't contain arsenic. <laughs> <laughs> Secret shoppers collected samples, these were analyzed, and it was found that they usually had either negligible quantities of arsenic or none whatsoever. So under the law, they weren't of the substance and quality that the purchaser had the right to expect. <laughs> now, in their defense, chemists claimed that it was just a fancy name building on the reputation of arsenic. Um, one cheeky chemist tried to point out, well, sunlight soap doesn't contain any sunlight either. <laughs> but um, I'm afraid the courts didn't go for that, and he still did get fined. In response to these cases, the makers of Dr. McKenzie's withdrew all their stocks, and they then replaced them with a new formula. So that was now guaranteed to contain arsenic. <laughs> I'm just going to stay for a moment with the idea of pressurizing people to look a certain way. Here's an Edwardian weight loss product that used a promotional tactic of appearing to be very scientific and up-to-date. Now, today's media sometimes present obesity as a rather modern phenomenon. Um, they say that you know, everybody in the past was walking miles every day, they didn't have Burger King on the corner, and so they're all absolutely fit as a fiddle. But in the Edwardian era, there was quite a large market for products like this that claimed to help you lose weight. And their selling points were usually that you wouldn't have to do any exercise and you wouldn't have to give up food. So it's obviously you know, quite an attractive option. This one was a pleasant, fizzy drink. Um, you'd have to take that in addition to anything that you were eating anyway. And the pamphlets claimed that it would break down the fat cells and remove them via the sweat and the urine. They did this um, by presenting a lot of really scientific-looking information. There was quite a lot of jargon. There were um, diagrams which you can probably just about make out at the bottom of the slide here, which shows the fat cells and the capillaries surrounding them, and that would explain how fat would be metabolized from the system. So that all sounded really plausible um, and very up to the minute, um, as though it was some kind of exciting new breakthrough in weight loss science. 
Of course, they didn't actually specify how this particular product would cause those things to happen. Um, they kind of glossed over that a little bit. And, of course, it didn't actually work. It was mainly bicarbonate of soda with a bit of pink colouring. As you can see from this picture, it's mainly aimed at women. Um, it was supposed to encourage people to want to go like the stout girl on this side to the so-called dainty girl on the other side. And it was in publications like the Girl's Own Paper, which was aimed at teenagers. So just like now, the pressure on women to look a certain way started at a young age. And in 1907, they were already using the science bit to legitimize the products. I realize I've just spent several minutes talking about issues relating to women. And if I did that on the internet, some guy would now pop up and say, actually, men actually have problems, actually, as well. <laughs> so here's an example of a specific type of Victorian quack who only targeted men. Now, from about the 1830s, there was a lot of interest in a disease called spermaturia. This was pretty much imaginary, and it was supposed to be a disease of the male reproductive system that would ultimately end in impotence, insanity, and death. <laughs> Within a Victorian context, it was literally seen as a draining away of the sufferer's masculinity. It threatened the very notions of manliness that were really important to the young man in Victorian society. And quack pamphlets like this one by Dr. Henry, that was a pseudonym, um, they would use some quite doom-mongering language about the withering and wasting of the vital parts. And that would convince potential customers that they were in great danger. And this disease wasn't, wasn't actually made up by quacks. It was kind of accepted by orthodox doctors as well. But some of them were fairly dismissive about it. Um, and others would recommend some quite unpleasant invasive treatments. So neither of those options were very satisfactory to patients. And quacks like this had a ready market of people wanting some kind of safe, confidential, and hopefully effective medicine. One of these unscrupulous quacks was somebody called Dr. Charles Daniel Hammond. And he sold a device called the Electric Curative and Phosphoric Vitalizer. Um, he had qualifications on his adverts. Um, they didn't really mean anything much. He would also claim to be from something called the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which he might have been referring to something in America, but in London where he practiced, that was not um, an actual body, so it didn't really mean anything. He also often tried to associate himself with the Locke Hospital, which was a very respected hospital for the treatment of venereal disease. And he would put in his adverts, Dr. Hammond of the Locke Hospital. Um, that in made people infer that he was a doctor there, but in fact he was just a subscriber to their charitable fund. Hammond's cure for spermaturia was an electric belt. This is a picture of his patent. Um, this ring of metal beads would go round the affected parts and then it would be held in place by a suspensory bandage. Um, and that was supposed to have an electric current in it. It didn't actually attach up to anything, perhaps fortunately. Um, <laughs> but you could, for an extra effect, put some kind of caustic medicine in this little bit at the bottom and use that screw to tighten it up. So that would probably give you a bit of a tingling feeling that felt like electricity. Um, Hammond might have made up his qualifications. But other quacks didn't need to, because they had, at some point, had some medical training. And they would then maybe decide that selling dubious remedies was a bit more lucrative than general practice. They could then use their qualifications to add legitimacy to whatever they were trying to do. This is an advert from the US at the beginning of the 20th century. It's for a drug addiction remedy called Habitina. Um, and that came in at about um, 1906 and lasted until 1912. It was produced by the Delta Chemical Company, and they made about half a million dollars over the time that they were operating. This company was run by Dr. Robert Pruitt, who had actually qualified as a doctor, but um, he didn't really have much success as a practicing physician. So he went into partnership with an insurance salesman called Ryland Bruce to create this product. 
The instructions for Habitina advised addicts to discontinue the use of all narcotic drugs and take sufficient Habitina to support the system without any of the old drug. And they should then taper off the dose until they weren't having any medicine at all. But as you can see from the bottle label, it did contain morphine sulfate and heroin. So it was just another source of addictive drugs with a fancy brand name on it. Um, tapering off the amount of drugs that you were taking was the reputable medical way of trying to treat addiction. But with something like this, people were sending off for it by mail order. So the company and the addicts knew that nobody was going to follow the instructions. Habitina was just cornering the market for narcotic drugs. They'd send out free samples to anybody who asked, and then once you were hooked, they would just keep selling it to you as long as you would keep paying. There's even an example of one woman who had apparently spent $2,600 on it over a period of three years. She'd even had to go without shoes in order to be able to afford it. So that's somebody who used his qualifications to give legitimacy to his practice. He was able to get away with this because by this time, you weren't allowed to send uh, poisons through the post, but you could if you were a qualified doctor. So he just about managed to stay on the right side of the law for that. Other practitioners, however, made a virtue of being unqualified, and they went into the tactic of discrediting the medical profession. This handsome fellow is Sequa. He started his career in Portsmouth in 1897. And he operated by doing big American-style medicine shows. He was originally from Yorkshire, but he'd probably been in America for a while and seen how the traveling quacks would go around with their wagons and um, their sales pitches. So he brought that to the UK. He'd start off his show by inviting people up on the stage to have their bad teeth drawn for free. And that would get an audience watching, um, and there'd be a brass band playing, probably to drown out the screams, but also to attract more of an audience. And there'd be lots of people dressed up in Wild West gear like this. The main bit of his sales pitch was then to get people suffering from rheumatism, which is rather a catch-all term for all kinds of aches and pains. He'd get them up on the stage and have them treated there and then with his products. And there was one called the Prairie Flower Medicine and one called Sequa's Oil. And this is one of his rather attractive adverts for it. These patients would be carried up the steps, they'd be treated, and afterwards they would walk jauntily away. To skeptics of the time, it did appear rather as though they were stooges, but in fact, it was a bit more interesting than that. They were genuine sufferers. They'd be local, so a lot of people would probably know them in the crowd. But Sequa would make it appear that there had been a massive transformation. First of all, he'd always have them carried onto the stage by his attendants dressed as cowboys. And Probably, they'd walked a couple of miles to get there in the first place, but they'd always be carried up to make it look as though they were very, very disabled. He'd then get them caught up in the hype and the sense of performance of being on the stage. He'd sub they'd subconsciously want to play their role in being actors in this show and not want to let the audience down by appearing not to get better. There were actually cases of people who had grumbled a bit and said that um, nothing much had happened to them, and the audience would turn against them and chase them out of the venue. <laughs> so we can really recognize some faith healing tactics there. Sequa emphasized that orthodox medical training was just about anatomy, signs and symptoms. Doctors just saw you as a collection of body parts, whereas he was the champion of true healing. Um, against this jealous and incompetent medical establishment. And that's a narrative, of course, that we're very familiar with still today. So I will now just look at that medical profession and tell you a bit about the context and the system against which these Victorian quacks were operating. I talk mainly about England and Wales because that's mostly what I've researched. Doctors had for centuries criticized people they saw as quacks. But during the course of the 19th century, these efforts intensified. Um, 
People wanted to warn the public away from the huge range of advertised medicines on offer. And there's just a few publications here um, that were being promoted and distributed about quackery. The quotation in the middle is from the Royal College of Surgeons back in 1839, and I will read that out just in case it's not completely clear on the slide. It is a remarkable fact that England, which claims to be the centre of civilization, should contain a population more quack-ridden, more credulous as regards the efficacy of universal secret specifics for the cure of disease than that of any other country in the world. Such attitudes coincided with a period of transformation for medical education and the identity of the medical profession. At the beginning of the 19th century, most local doctors would be surgeon apothecaries. They didn't have a medical degree, but they would have done an apprenticeship with an older practitioner who might or might not have been a good teacher. Either way, the apprentice would then be let loose to find his own patients. From 1815 and the Apothecaries Act, there was a minimum qualification to practice in England and Wales. And by the beginning of the Victorian era, usually what people would do would be to take the exams of college and hall. That was the Royal College of Surgeons and Apothecaries Hall. So they'd be doubly qualified in surgery and in dispensing medicines. Only people who did an actual medical degree were technically entitled to be called doctor. But in practice, most of the surgeon apothecaries, who are now known as general practitioners, would probably be called Dr. So-and-so by their local community. Well, during the Victorian era, gaining a medical education became increasingly hard work. The amount of commitment, expense and stress involved was immense. And at the end of it, contrary to popular opinion, you wouldn't necessarily even be able to make a living. So it was understandably a bit galling for qualified practitioners to see people coming along and selling a remedy and making a fortune without having put in all these years of hard work. And defining themselves against quackery became increasingly important for one's identity as a doctor. In 1858, there was a medical act that provided for our medical register. Um, but that still didn't actually stop unqualified practitioners from carrying on. They just had to be careful not to claim that they were on the register. Several characteristics marked medicine out as quackery in the eyes of the profession. Partly it was a lack of qualifications on the part of the proprietor, but there were other things as well. First of all, the ingredients and the recipe for these remedies were generally kept secret. Often, they weren't actually very different at all from the kinds of things that you would get from a doctor's prescription. But patent medicine vendors could imply that there was some kind of exotic origin story behind them. They could present it perhaps as something natural and mystical that narrow-minded doctors wouldn't accept. This one, for example, is Ali Ahmed's Treasures of the Desert. And that was a range of medicines that was supposedly created centuries ago by a, a physician in the mountains of Syria. Um, in reality, it wasn't very different from other similar products on the market. They're laxatives, mostly. As well as having secret ingredients, quack remedies were generally advertised, um, whereas a member of the medical profession would get into quite big trouble if they advertised their services. This is a picture of a railway station in 1874. You can see the huge number of signs for products of all types, including quite a few medical ones. So it's quite difficult to avoid all these advertising messages. Another reason why doctors considered patent medicines to be quackery was that you could buy them without any medical advice whatsoever. Although Victorian doctors might get a bit of a bad rap, really, for not having many effective medicines at their disposal, what they did have was a really good knowledge of anatomy from years of study and dissection. They also had a pretty decent ability to diagnose disease and give a prognosis. But an untrained quack didn't have that expertise, so they were more prone to fitting the diagnosis to their medicine rather than prescribing according to the diagnosis. The campaigners, um, including the British Medical Association and the Lancet, who are behind the Medical Act of 1858, had made a bit of an assumption that it's understandable for them, but it was maybe not quite correct. 
they thought that given all the information about a practitioner's qualifications, the average person would always want to go with a qualified doctor every time. Now, the average person is a bit of a law unto themselves. And of course, there were still a lot of good reasons for people to continue choosing quack remedies. For a start, regular doctor's fees were out of reach for many people. There were ways of getting medical care, even if you were destitute. But for a lot of people, proper medical care wasn't guaranteed. So a quack remedy might seem like a really good, convenient, and economical option. People were operating within a tradition of self-reliance. There was nobody who had responsibility for patching you up if you got sick. It was all down to yourself. You were pretty much on your own. So you had to be proactive about choosing the practitioners that you wanted to help you. Patent remedies also conferred the advantage of anonymity. And that was particularly useful if you were dealing with some kind of embarrassing ailment or something considered morally dubious at the time, like syphilis or unwanted pregnancy. You wouldn't have to go face to face with your family doctor who would know all of the members of your local community. And consulting a regular doctor could mean that you ended up with some quite distressing treatments, either invasive things or medicines that contain some fairly harsh ingredients and could give you horrible side effects. So a quack that could promise a safe and painless and natural, gentle remedy was really quite an attractive option. One way in which somebody might decide that a medicine was a good bet was by reading all the testimonials that were published in quack pamphlets and advertisements. And we're accustomed nowadays to celebrities endorsing all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And that was the case in the Victorian era as well. This is an advert for the ammonia phone, which appeared on the scene in the 1890s. And that was aimed at anybody who wanted to improve the quality of their voice. So that could be singers, preachers, or MPs. Um, but it was also for um, medical conditions like asthma and tuberculosis. This is what it looks like. It was a long flute-like metal tube, um, and it had some material inside it which was impregnated with hydrogen peroxide, peppermint oil, and ammonia. The inventor referred to this as artificially Italianized air. <laughs> He'd spent some time in Italy, and he came to the conclusion that Italy produced so many good opera singers because of the quality of the air there, so he wanted to bring that to rainy Britain. To use it, you would have to put your fingers on a little valve at either end and um, basically suck the knob in the middle. Hey. <laughs> now, because it was aimed at people who wanted to be good singers, they would get the opera stars of the day to give testimonials. This is Adelina Patti, who actually pops up on quite a few quack remedies. And she is saying there, I've used the ammonia phone and found its effect most beneficial. But the company's method of collecting these testimonials was not always very scrupulous. Any high-profile person who owned an ammonia phone was fair game for being included in an advert. So all the company had to do was send them a free ammonia phone, and then they would have one in their possession. They then write to them occasionally and offer to replenish the chemicals inside. Even the most non-committal of letters back thanking them could then be manipulated into an endorsement. One of the targets was the Prime Minister of the time, W. E. Gladstone. His secretary wrote to the company saying, Mr. Gladstone has received your letter of the 9th and desires me to thank you for your kind offer to recharge his ammonia phone. When exhausted, he will bear it in mind. So this strongly implied that Gladstone wasn't very interested in this device. It was probably sitting in a cupboard somewhere. But this nevertheless qualified as a testimonial, and the proprietors lost no opportunity to link the Prime Minister's name with the ammonia phone from then on. Now, given that the Prime Minister is not necessarily always the most popular person in the country, this tactic could backfire. The inventor was doing a lecture at a concert to promote the ammonia phone and mentioned Gladstone's name, which made the entire audience hiss. <laughs> now, that smoothly brings me on to something else that hisses, namely snakes. 
I particularly wanted to talk about snake oil today, partly because it's such an iconic, iconic image of the history of quackery, but also because there's a few myths going on about it on the internet. The phrase snake oil, now meaning something fraudulent and worthless, is applied not just to health, but to any kind of dodgy activities now, such as hollow political promises. But the terminology um, originates from the late 19th and early 20th century snake oil vendors of the US. And they'd um, sell their wares by eye-catching adverts like this one, and also by doing dangerous displays of snake handling in public. And the products weren't always what they were supposed to be. This is Clark Stanley's, which is one of the, well, it is the best remembered today. A lot of people see this as the snake oil liniment, but in fact, in its time, it was just one of many very similar products. But that was analysed in 1916 and found to be made of just mineral oil and beef fat and um, a bit of camphor and turpentine. So there was no snake content in it. If you research the history of snake oil on the internet, you come across the same story time and time again. It's on Wikipedia and a variety of other pages. And that says that it originated in China and was brought to America by Chinese laborers on um, the first transcontinental railroad, which started in 1864. They then shared it with all their American colleagues, and everybody was so impressed that it just took off, um, and people started making their own types of it. Now, it's perfectly plausible to say that uh, Chinese medicine did have snake oil in it. Um, and the Chinese remedies were apparently made from a water snake species called Enhydris chinensis. Um, in the 1980s, there was um, a small study done suggesting that that snake species contains um, an omega-3 fatty acid that might have some anti-inflammatory properties. And because of that, I've seen this story used as a way of encouraging skeptics not to be closed-minded. Proponents of the story will say, snake oil actually worked. We should be humble about considering these products from the past. The implication usually is that you should accept the claims of whatever snake oil they're trying to sell in the modern day. It's an example of the woozle effect, really, which is where something gets cited across the internet um, again and again, but when you trace it back to its original sources, it's pretty flimsy. And the problem with the story is that there's plenty of quite easy-to-find evidence that snake oil was being used in America long before the Chinese immigrants arrived. Um, and the Americans were using plain old rattlesnakes, so it doesn't really matter if Chinese water snakes are good for you, because that's not really what we're talking about when we talk about snake oil. French sailors in New Orleans in the 18th century, for example, described the Choctaw Nation using rattlesnake fat as a healing liniment. And that traditional Native American knowledge made its way into the medical books that were used by white settlers. Um, when people were living in very isolated areas, they wouldn't have any access to medicine, so they would um, have a book to refer to. Um, and there are things like um, the Family Advisor in 1828, which listed rattlesnake oil alongside the oils of bear, hen, squirrel, goose, mud turtle, skunk, and wildcat as potentially healing. Um, and there were other examples of books from the 1830s as well. And commercial rattlesnake oil as a remedy was available as early as 1842 um, by a druggist in Vermont. And by that time, snake oil already had a slightly questionable reputation. Describing the life of a rattlesnake hunter in Pennsylvania in 1849, one local paper described the oil as something that ignorant people have been quackized to believe in for its superior virtues for rheumatism and sprains. As the demand for snake oil grew, rattlesnake hunting was joined by snake farms where people would fatten them up to be able to harvest the oil easily. And some of these farmers would promote their business by taking some rattlesnakes out on tour and doing shows to promote their products. And this is an advert for Warner's rattlesnake oil. And the proprietor, Frederick Warner, um, on the, action, the very day that this advert was placed, he got bitten by one of his rattlesnakes and was not able to do the show. He did survive, though. It could also, unfortunately, be a bit dangerous for the snake, 
as is shown in this rather poignant news story from 1927. A snake bit its handler and then sadly slithered across the Rainbow Bridge. It was obviously easier and safer for some snake oil vendors to move away from the real thing. Um, so numerous brands of snake oil were popping up well into the 20th century. And even when brands like Clark Stanley's, which I showed you before, were exposed as misleading, there was still quite a good market for the real thing. But by that time, it had become associated with the brash fakery that we associate with the metaphorical snake oil of today. Snake oil's heyday coincided with a renewal of efforts from anti-quackery campaigners to try to stamp out these kinds of products. In 1905, the journalist Samuel Hopkins Adams was commissioned by Collier's Weekly to write a series of articles about patent medicines. And they were published under the name The Great American Fraud. That was later compiled into a book. Now, he was absolutely merciless in his condemnation of these products. He named and shamed more than 260 different remedies over the course of 11 articles. And one of those was one of the best-selling remedies of the time, called Peruna. Um, that was sold by Dr. Samuel B. Hartman from Columbus in Ohio. He was a qualified doctor, but he'd given up medical practice in order to sell remedies. And that was quite a good career move, because it made him a millionaire. Behind the scenes, he was pretty upfront about what he was doing with Peruna. He said it was essentially a faith cure, and that people would feel better because they believed in its claims, and they believed the testimonials of people just like them who had used them. Part of its popularity was probably also because it was 28% alcohol. <laughs> so it was a particular favorite in states that had prohibition laws and was also said to be quite popular with members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. <laughs> At this time, Samuel Hopkins Adams wasn't the only person trying to um, educate the public about things going on. There was also various exposés about conditions in the food industry as well. Um, and all this public attention contributed in part to the passage of the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. That didn't ban patent medicines, but it did mean that you now had to label them correctly, and also you were not supposed to make any claims above and beyond what the medicine could really do. Now, fortunately for modern historians, the FDA has digitized a lot of the court cases of misbranding where people didn't stick to those rules. And if you dig about on the database, it's possible to find some really unusual and interesting remedies. Um, for example, this one that was introduced in 1915. <laughs> it is slightly difficult to understand why naming a product after Satan would be a good selling point, but it does seem to have enjoyed brief success. And it did contain some active ingredients. The range included um, a liniment and a laxative. Um, the, the laxative would supposedly bring mental sunshine. It would prevent a lazy liver from going on strike, and it would act like an energy gland transplanted into the body to restore the vigor of youth. But one thing that the Pure Food and Drug Act didn't cover was medical devices. So in the early years of the 20th century, there were all sorts of strange contraptions popping up that were trying to part customers from their money. One example of these was called the diagraphoscope. This was a diagnostic device, and there was only one in the whole of the United States. They would take it on tour, and people could consult it in their local newspaper officer, office. Um, and that was supposed to give a detailed 3D picture of the inside of the body. It was meant to supersede x-rays, um, and the practitioner would be able to see your heart beating and see any diseases that were deep within your body. One skeptical visitor described this as a circular tube full of colored liquid. Uh, the person operating it would use um, a photographer's hood. They would just look through it um, at that, and then they would tell you what was wrong with you. That was all there was to it. The company also claimed to be able to deposit new body parts into people. Um, they were supposed to be able to renew somebody's stomach lining. 
by a powerful current which is perfectly harmless and painless. Uh, and of course, nobody could really tell that they hadn't done that. So the proprietor was, in fact, arrested for that in 1912 and fined $700. And just to flick through a few other examples of devices that were on sale, there was the pandiculator for stretching you out and making you taller. There were also Dr. Walter's medicated rubber garments for making you thinner. And there were a large number of different vacuum caps for baldness. <laughs> now, while all these things were on sale, the American Medical Association started a campaign of public education that was designed to expand on what Samuel Hopkins Adams had done with his great American fraud. The AMA's Bureau of Investigation, led by Dr. Arthur J. Cramp, looked into the contents and the claims of a variety of patent medicines on the market, and they published the results in widely available pamphlets called Nostrums and Quackery. Um, they brought these together as books in between 1911 and 1936. There's Nostrums and Quackery there. There's also the Hygieia Health magazine, which was widely available and accessible to the public. In 1938, the Food, Drugs and Cosmetics Act brought cosmetics within the remit of the FDA as well, but it wasn't until as late as 1976 that medical devices were included. Meanwhile, in the UK, the British Medical Association was doing something similar. In the first decade of the 20th century, the British Medical Journal published a series of articles um, under the term Secret Remedies, and these were compiled into books called Secret Remedies and More Secret Remedies in 1909 and 1912. These are available as digitized copies on the internet, and they're really quite an interesting read. They showed the public what a huge markup there was on a lot of these patent medicines, which were comprised in very, very unremarkable ingredients. This one is called Mersiren, and this was a hangover cure, but it was also mainly promoted for seasickness. And that was supposed to be made from some potent herbs which were found in one very specific valley in the Himalayas. This sold for two shillings and ninepence for 20 tablets. And the herbs were supposed to be unknown to Western science and would therefore not submit to Western analysis techniques. Um, so, Western analysis techniques revealed that it was just powdered potato. <laughs> <laughs> Partly as a result of all this public attention, in 1914, um, the Parliament conv convened a select committee on patent remedies. And that reported that although there were some laws in place, they were effectively powerless to stop anybody producing some kind of remedy and making whatever claims they liked about it. Not an awful lot happened after the um, Parliamentary Committee, but eventually there was the Pharmacy and Medicines Act of 1941, which prohibited advertising of remedies for certain diseases. And it also required the remedies to list their ingredients properly. And then in the 1950s, there was the Food and Drugs Act, which clamped down further on misleading claims. But regardless of changes in the law and the efforts of skeptics in the past to educate the public, the attraction of quack remedies has just never gone away. Decades later, as we will be talking a lot about over this weekend, health gurus are still making a fortune by selling unproven remedies and giving people false hope. Technology changes, politics and society change, Communication methods change, but the underlying human psychology that makes quack remedies so very easy to sell gives us a fascinating connection with our ancestors' experiences. Thank you. I think... I think we've got time for one or two questions. If anyone would make, like to make their way to the microphone that's at the center aisle, if you're happy to take questions, that is.
Hello, Hi. thank you. Hi. Um, is this on? Let me check. I don't if that's think it's on. on. Uh -huh. Is there a switch on it or something? I don't know. I can shout. Yeah, shout. Okay, shout. shout is the way. Um, do you think that it is better to regulate quack medicine or leave it unregulated? Um, I think, as we've seen from the historical experience, regulation has not particularly worked. I, mean, I suppose it has made a variety of over-the-counter medicines a lot safer. I mean, it hasn't dealt with the really unscrupulous quacks. Um, I think you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I'm much more on the side of regulating, um, because I think that without regulation, there would be an awful lot more dangerous ingredients being introduced into things that were available They're in, for example, modern-day chemists. So you might now have things that are fairly inert and useless that you can buy, but we've not got things like mercury, um, arsenic, antimony, and all the variety of things that are available in Victorian medicines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? No, can we have it one more time for Caroline Rance? Thank you. Thanks.